Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting edition of Ed Puzzle Lecture Notes. Now, remember, this is your lecture. This is me talking. Just like any instructor here at Western or when you go to college, you listen to lecture in order to try and pass your class to do the best you can. So, if you have this playing off in the background while you're doing something else, you are not going to learn it. In order to get a good grade, you need to actually pay attention. Hopefully you're watching this with a partner and you guys are discussing it, taking notes, and answering the questions correctly. So, if you want a grade like this, a D or an F, sure, play it in the background and then just do something else, not pay attention, and you will get that grade. But if you're looking for something higher, pay attention, take some notes, and actually discuss the material. Alright, so these are biotic relationships. Biotic, remember, that means living. And I think we all know what relationships are. It's not like husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend. But these are relationships between living things in the environment. And one type of relationship is called competition. Now, if you're an athlete, you should know everything there is to know about competition. Every week, the football team, volleyball team, soccer team, whatever, they compete. They're in competition with the other team. But also, during the week, you're also in competition with your own teammates for who's going to start. There can only be one starting quarterback. There can only be one head cheerleader. So you're actually in competition with your own team as well. Well, the same thing happens in nature. Now, squirrels and wolves and plants, they don't, they don't compete to be the starting quarterback, but they do compete for ecological resources, things in the wild that they need. So some of the things that these organisms, these animals and plants compete for, obviously food. Many organisms are competing for the same food source. And the more food you can get, the better chance you are to survive. Also, organisms compete for water, especially plants. If your roots do not grow fast enough to get down to the water, you have a less chance of, of surviving. Same thing with light with plants. If you don't grow fast, you might be left in the shade, which don't, doesn't allow you to get that light that you need. Shelter, mates, dominance, etc. These are all things that organisms compete in the wild for. And basically, just like any athletic, there's two possible outcomes if two organisms are in direct competition with each other. You either win and survive, or you lose the struggle and you die, or you have to leave the area, which is called emigration. It's not immigration, that's coming into the area, but if you leave the area, that's called emigration. So competition is one type of biotic relationship that organisms do in the wild. Now there are two broad classes of competition in the wild. The first one is called intra-specific competition. And intra-specific competition is competition that happens between members of the same species. Now I remember this because I used to play sports and if you have an intra-squad game that means you're playing against your own teammates. It's like a practice game, intra-squad. Well, intra-specific competition, it could be like two male lions in Africa competing for the right to mate with the female lions. That's intra-specific because the lions are obviously the same species. It could also be like two packs of wolves in Canada which are competing for the same food sources like deer or elk. That would be intraspecific because they are the same species. There's also interspecific competition. Now that's when two different species are competing for the same thing. Now the way I remember this is in football if you throw an interception you threw it to the wrong team. You threw it to a different species of football team, if, if you will. So interspecific is different species. So that could be, say, wolves and a bear competing for the same food source in Yellowstone National Park. They are different species. They're competing for the same food. That would be interspecific competition. 
two different species of plants competing for maybe water or sunlight. Since they're different species and they're competing for the same resources, that would also be inter-specific competition. And here's some little examples of competition. This little gopher here looks like he was, you know, lucky enough to find some something to eat. I don't know if it's a peanut or what it, what he's got there, but he's trying to eat it while these other these birds are trying to take it from him. They're both competing for that same food source. Here's the question: What type of competition is that? Since these birds. And Mr. Gopher here, or Mrs. Gopher, I can't tell. Since they're competing for the same thing and they're different species, that would be inter-specific competition. Here are two elephant seals, male elephant seals, competing for the right to mate with the females. Now, you can see it's bloody. These guys are not messing around. They are competing to mate with the females. What type of competition would this be? Hopefully, you said, since these are the same species in competition, that would be intra-specific competition. And here you can see a bunch of plants, a bunch of trees in a rainforest. Basically, if you are a slow-growing tree, you get left in the shade. And you should know by now, trees, autotrophs, they use photosynthesis to make their own food. So if you're, if you're down at the bottom in the shade, you will lose, you will not survive. It is very advantageous to grow fast to get up in the sunlight where you can make your own food. So these are all types of competition that occurs in the wild. All right, now here's this little concept that you're just going to kind of have to know. I'm not going to make it a written question, but there will be one or two questions, multiple choice questions on our test. The competitive exclusion principle. And that just states that no two species can occupy the exact same niche. Now, hopefully you remember what a niche is. That's like the job or role an organism plays in its community. But they can't have the exact same niche at the same time in the same area or habitat because they would compete for too many things. If they're in direct competition with each other and they have to compete for everything... That is not good for either one. One of those guys is not going to win. One of them is going to lose and die out. So that's the competitive exclusion principle. It's basically like there's not enough room for the two of us here. One of us is going to win and one of us is going to die out. That's the competitive exclusion principle. All right, so another type of biotic relationship, and I think most of you guys are kind of familiar with this. It's called predation. Predation is an interaction which one organism captures and eats or feeds on another organism. Obviously, that's positive for one and negative for the other. So like this guy, you have a spider here. He caught and is going to eat this mantis, this praying mantis right here. Positive for the spider. He's like, yeah, I get something to eat. For the praying mantis, he's probably not as excited about this relationship as the spider is. So the and the predator is the one that is hunting, the one that is doing the eating. And the prey is the guy that is hunted that gets eaten. So the predator here would be the spider. And the prey in this circumstance would be the praying mantis. All right, so here's a picture of the biotic relationship called predation. Here you have a lynx, this guy right here, that cat. And you have a hare. Snowshoe hair, that guy right there. This is not a long-lasting relationship. These guys are not going to hang out with each other. This is a predator-prey relationship. So they are not going to spend a long time together. Either the hair is going to escape or the lynx is going to eat the hair. Hopefully the hair gets away. I'm rooting for him. I don't know what happened. But anyways, that's what predation is. The hunter hunting and eating the prey. And this is what it looks like if you graph the predator-prey relationship. So over here we have in blue, we have the rabbit population. And we're going to compare that with what looks like a fox population. Now, as you can see, at first, the prey or the rabbit population starts to go up. Well, now there's a bunch of rabbits. 
And that is good for foxes, because if there's a lot of food for them to eat, there's hardly any of them that are starving. So after the prey population goes up, since there's so many rabbits, the fox population starts to go up. Now, there's a lot of foxes. The population of foxes is high. Now there's all kinds of foxes that are eating the rabbits. That causes the rabbit population to go down because they're all getting eaten. Well, in turn, since now there's not that many rabbits, since the population of rabbits went down, that causes the fox population to go down. Well, in turn, since now there's not that many foxes to eat the rabbits, that causes the rabbit population to go back up. So now there's rabbits all over the place. And once again, the fox is like, whoa, look at all these rabbits. So that is good for the fox population, which causes it to go up. And you can see what happens. Since there's a lot of foxes, that causes the rabbit population to go down. So they're basically dependent on each other. It's always the prey goes first. The prey goes up. The population of the prey goes up, which causes the population of the predator to go up. That causes the population of the prey to go down because there's a lot of predators. And that then causes the population of the predators to go down. So they both go back and forth going up and down. So anyways, the predator in this thing would be obviously the fox. The fox is the predator. The rabbit is the prey. Which population is higher most of the time? Of course, it's got to be the rabbit. Because you need a lot of rabbits to feed one fox. So you need more prey than you do predators. So the prey population is almost always higher. Describe the relationship between the predator and the prey. Well, when the prey goes up, that then causes the predator population to go up. Which then causes the prey population to go down because there's a lot of predators. Which then causes the predator population to go down because there's not as much food to eat. Which then, since there's not as many predators to eat them, causes the rabbit or the prey population to go back up. So that is the relationship between a predator and a prey. All right, so now we're going to look at some long-lasting relationships between organisms in the wild. Remember, the predator-prey, that is not a long-lasting relationship. Either the, either the prey escapes and gets as far away from the predator as he can, or the prey gets eaten. But it's a very short relationship. But here, this is going to be a long-lasting relationship. And these, this is called symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is any long-lasting relationship between two species in which at least one of the species, one of the organisms, benefits from it. And there's going to be three different types. Mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. All right, so the first symbiotic relationship we're going to talk about is called parasitism. Hopefully you've heard of the word parasite. Parasite, you think of things like fleas and ticks, things like your pets can get. Well, this is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefits and the other is harmed. So it's basically one of them says, yes, this is great. And the other one says, I hate this relationship. So I don't know if you've ever had fleas. But I'm guessing if you did, you probably didn't like it. Because the fleas bite you. They try to they suck your blood. It makes you itch. Not good for you. Not good for your dog. Not good for your cat. Not good for anything in the wild. But the flea says, this is awesome. I get to, I get to live in your hair. I get to suck your blood. It's nice and warm. I get, to, I get to ride around on you. It's awesome. So for the flea, it's good. But for the, for the host, it's, it's bad. Same thing for like tapeworms. These are worms that live inside your intestines. Intestines of different animals. And all they do is they live there. They wait for you to eat. And when you eat, they basically eat the food that you eat. So, if your dog or your cat gets tapeworms, they can be super, super skinny no matter how much dog food or cat food they eat because the tapeworm is getting all the nutrition from the food they eat. Once again, that is bad. Thumbs down. It's bad for the host 
but it's good for the tapeworm because all it has to do is sit there, wait for you to eat, and it gets all the nutrition from your food. So that's what parasitism is. It's good for one, it's good for the parasite, but it's bad for the host. And here's a couple parasites. There's Mr. Flea. There's Mr. Tick. So if this is you, if this is your hair right here, this tick thinks this is awesome. It says, yes, plus. This is a great relationship. I get to suck on this person's blood. It's nice and warm. I love it. But for you, it would be negative. It would be bad. You would not like it. So it's good for the parasite, bad for the host. That's parasitism. Here's another form of parasitism. This is elephantiasis, which is called by, caused by a parasitic worm. And it causes your extremities, in this, in this instance it's the legs, to inflate, to expand, to swell, just like this. Once again, it's good for the worm that causes it. I'm going to guess, and I, I, I don't know who this person is, but I'm going to guess, it's bad for this person. This person probably says, no, that's a negative relationship. While the worm says, ooh, I like this relationship. Once again, that's parasitism. Now we're going to move on to the symbiotic relationship of mutualism. And this is a good one. I like this one. It's a relationship in which both organisms benefit from it. So they both like it. Now I'm not going to explain... This, that's a type of bacteria that's found in termites' gut or lichen. It'll take too long. And I'll show you on the next slide what an example of mutualism is. Alright, so here would be an example of mutualism. Here's a little tiny little cleaner fish. And this is a gigantic sea bass. They get huge. Now this, this little cleaner fish here, he's actually coming in and the, the giant sea bass actually likes it because this guy's coming in and is picking off parasites. Little parasites that are on the sea bass. He's, he's eating them. He's eating them off the sea bass. So that is good for the cleaner fish because he's getting a free meal. It's also good for the giant sea bass because he's getting cleaned of the parasites which are stuck on him. So it's good plus for the cleaner fish and it's also good plus for the sea bass. Sea bass gets cleaned, cleaner fish gets food, everybody's happy. That is what's called mutualism. Mutualism, everybody's happy. All right, last slide, and the last type of symbiotic relationship. It's called commensalism. That's a relationship in which one of the organism is helped. It says yes, plus. And the other one is neither hurt, but it's also not helped. It doesn't care. It's like neutral. So we say it's like zero. So if you didn't know, you have like millions of skin mites on your skin, and they like to eat your dead skin. Good for the skin mite, they get food. For you, it doesn't matter one way or the other. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide of another uh, example of commensalism. All right, so here we have what looks like a nurse shark. And we have these little tiny, they, sometimes they're called pilot fish or remoras. They swim right next to the shark. The shark is not helped or hurt. The shark, you know, maybe they bug them. I don't know. They're like, why do these fish follow me? But the shark are not hurt by them. Now, for the remora fish, when this shark eats something, little pieces of whatever it eats float away. And yay, these little remora fish say, thank you very much. I'll take those little pieces of food and eat that. Also, it's a lot easier for these guys to swim because they're almost stuck to the shark, so they have to use less energy to swim. But, once again, the shark is not helped or hurt. He, it doesn't bother him one way or the other. But the remoras, the pilot fish, yes, this is great. I love the relationship. So that is commensalism. One organism does not care one way or the other, but the other, other organism is helped from the relationship. All right, thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.